All right. In 1993, property on the outskirts of Waco named Mount Carmel became the site of the largest loss of life in law enforcement agent law enforcement actions in American history. In 2003, when I spoke with Lee Hancock, a reporter with the Dallas Morning News, I learned that someone in the FBI had given her copies of numerous internal FBI documents relating to the Branch Davidians. The FBI had designated the incident the Wakemore, the Waco murder case. This acronym was a reference to the fact that four Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms agents were killed in a shootout between the Branch Davidians and assaulting ATF agents on February 28, 1993. The FBI's acronym does not reflect the fact that five Branch Davidians were killed as a result of the shootout, and a sixth Branch Davidian was killed by ATF agents about 5 p.m. as he tried to walk back to Mount Carmel. Hancock sent her many documents to me, and I placed them in the Loyola University of New Orleans archive. Six years later, they were relocated to the Whitliffe Collections archive at Texas State University San Marcos, so they would be available to other researchers. One of the documents in the Wakemore Major e is the Wakemore Major Event Log, with entries dating from February 28, 1993 to February 4, 1993. The major event log is a compilation of multiple logs kept by FBI agents. The three primary logs with entries in the major event log are one kept by the FBI negotiators, one kept by members of the FBI's hostage rescue team known as the HRT, and one kept by FBI officials in the Strategic Information and Operations Center, SIOC, in the Hoover Building in Washington, D.C. The major event log contains only two entries for April 19, 1993. But there is a separate Wakemore major case log for April 19, again consisting of entries logged by multiple FBI sources. The primary logs reflected in the Wakemore major case April 19, 1993 logs, uh, log are the HRT, SIOC, and sounds and conversations picked up by two of the surveillance devices in the building. The April 19, 1993 log begins in the early a.m. and concludes at 10.30 p.m. FBI agents on the ground first spotted fire at 12.11 p.m. Several alternative FBI narratives emerge from the internal FBI documents in the Hancock collection. The two logs reveal that the narrative of the negotiators competed with the narratives of the HRT agents and the FBI officials associated with SIOC. The logs reveal that special agents in charge, the negotiators and HRT agents in Waco, were reporting constantly to officials in SIOC. The logs indicate that SIOC officials collaborated with the lead special agent in charge and the HRT agents in undercutting the negotiations and leading the process toward an assault. The major case log reveals that FBI agents knew that a fire was the likely outcome of an assault. As the process documented in the major event log moved inexorably toward the FBI's tank and CS gas assault on April 19, 1993, Negotiators were busy recording the breakthroughs they were having in persuading David Koresh to formulate an act on an exit plan. On April 19th, officials in SIOC were watching and listening to the assault in real time. The SIOC officials could hear the audio picked up by bugs, as did the commanders on the ground. They were watching the assault via closed circuit television. The officials in SIOC were so well informed about the moment-to-moment -moment events during the assault, the log conveys the impression that they could have slowed or stopped the assault at any point. Both the officials in SIOC and the commanders directing the assault were aware that beginning at 9.44 a.m., Branch Davidian Graham Craddock, under the supervision of Steve Schneider at the front door, 
went outside the building to signal that a tank had severed the field telephone line going into the building and that the Branch Davidians wanted it fixed so they could inform the FBI about the progress David Koresh was making writing his commentary on the seven seals in the Book of Revelation, after the completion of which Koresh would come out according to his promise on April 14, 1993. There were several special agents in charge in Waco, but the primary one was Jeffrey Jamar of the San Antonio FBI office. Richard Schwein of the El Paso office was in charge of the night shift. Bob Ricks in Oklahoma City frequently served as the FBI spokesman, spokesman in the press briefings. The HRT commander was assistant special agent in charge, Richard Rogers. Gary Nessner was the FBI negotiation coordinator from March 1 until March 24, when he was taken off the case for protesting the HRT's aggressive actions toward the Branch Davidians as counteracting progress in negotiations. Nessner reports his views in his 2010 book, Stalling for Time. During the negotiations with the Branch Davidians, carried out first by Lieutenant Larry Lynch of the McLennan County Sheriff's Department and then by FBI negotiators uh, and then by FBI negotiators supervised by Nessner, the Branch Davidians sent out 21 children and a total of 14 adults came out. Clint Van Zant was the FBI negotiation coordinator from March 25th through April 19th. There is no evidence in the logs that he played a role during the April 19, 1993 assault, except to call SIOC and tell officials that the Branch Davidians wanted their phone fixed so they could communicate with FBI agents. It was never fixed. Both Nessner and Van Zant were sent to Waco by the Special Operations and Research Unit in the FBI Academy at Quantico, Virginia. A key negotiator was Supervisory Special Resident Agent Byron Sage from the Austin FBI office. He was not the lead negotiator as he is often characterized in the media. Sage arrived in Waco on February 28, 1993 after the shootout between the ATF agents and the Branch Davidians. He went to the McLennan County Sheriff's Department and carried out negotiations whenever Lynch needed a break during the 24-hour 911 call, which had been initiated by Branch Davidian Wayne Martin. After other, other, excuse me, after other FBI agents arrived and took over the case on March 1, 1993, Sage stayed on as negotiator. In his book, Nessner reveals that he learned from the negotiators who stayed on the case that, quote, Van Zant did not get along with Jamar, who cut him out of the decision-making process. Byron Sage became the de facto team leader and through the remainder of the incident, played the key negotiation leadership role, end quote. When FBI officials in Washington were trying to get the approval of Attorney General Janet Reno for the assault, she wanted a status report on the negotiations. In a two-hour conversation on April 15, 1993, Sage told the acting associate attorney general that negotiations were at an impasse and there was nothing more negotiators could do to persuade Koresh to come out or to send others out. He neglected to say that on the day before, on April 14, Koresh had notified the FBI of his exit plan first through a telephone conversation with his attorney in the morning, who immediately informed the FBI agents, and then in writing in a letter. It also seems important to me that FBI agents knew that Koresh had signed a contract with his criminal attorney to represent him when he came out. The officials with SIOC who supervised the FBI agents at Waco were Deputy Assistant Director Danny Colson, Assistant Director Larry Potts and Michael Cahoe, Chief of the Violent Crimes and Major Offenders Section. These three officials reported to Deputy Director Floyd Clark and Director William Sessions. Sessions, Clark, and Potts met with Attorney General Janet Reno on April 17, 1993 to persuade her to approve the, quote, proposed operational plan, end quote. 
Colson reveals in his book that during the assault on April 19, 1993, quote, Reno, Clark, Potts, and a few other big shots, end quote, were in the small command center at SIOC while he stayed in SIOC's big room. Reno left shortly after 10 a.m. to give a speech. It is illegal for law enforcement agents to fire blindly into a residence. During the siege, Branch Davidians alleged to the media until their contact was cut off and to FBI negotiators that ATF agents in the helicopters fired down through the roof of the building and other ATF agents fired through the windows and walls, thereby killing or mortally wounding Branch Davidians. They asserted that bullet holes in the roof, walls, and front door of the building would support their allegations. Dick DeGuerin and Jack Zimmerman, the attorneys of David Koresh and Steve Schneider, reported to the press during the siege that they saw many incoming bullet holes when they went inside the building. During the siege, the Branch Davidians expressed concern that the building be preserved to provide evidence supporting their allegations. Numerous details of the siege are recorded in the major event log. Here I have time to mention only a few of them. During the siege, FBI agents interviewed former Branch Davidians, Branch Davidians not at Mount Carmel, and relatives and acquaintances of the Branch Davidians. The memos reporting on these interviews are in the Hancock collection. FBI profilers Pete Smerick and Mark Young wrote memos on March 5th, 7th, and 8th explaining that the Branch Davidians believed that they would die in an assault by federal agents and they therefore advised the FBI not to take aggressive actions that would confirm Koresh's prophecies. On March 9th, under pressure from superiors, they wrote a memo advocating non-offensive non actions, quote, to break the spirit of David Koresh and the control he exerts, he exercises over his followers, end quote. The major event log records an entry by SIOC on March 15th, quote, SSA Smerick supports the current tactics of, of cutting off the power, media access, and negotiations. This has taken away the control he enjoyed earlier. On March 20th, while day-long negotiations for the exit of a number of Branch Davidians were occurring, at 9.16 p.m., SIOC logged that Jeffrey Jamar spoke with Danny Colson in SIOC. They, quote, agreed that we seem to get more productive results when we put pressure on the compound, i.e. using CEVs, combat engineering vehicles, to move, ma move material from compound area, pushing bus down the road, et cetera, end quote. The entry records that Colson and Jamar, quote, both agree that more pressure is needed, end quote. They waited until seven adults came out on March 21st before implementing the increased pressure. At 5.54 p.m. on that day, some of the Branch Davidians' vehicles were removed. Nessner writes in his book that he confronted Jamar, telling him that tactical actions were not conducive to gaining the Branch Davidians' trust and getting people out. This is probably the conversation in which Nessner tried to dissuade Jamar from permitting Richard Schwein to play irritating sounds at night on the loudspeakers, which began that evening. That night, Nessner's superior called and told him that he was being removed as negotiation coordinator due to the intervention of a, quote, high official at FBI headquarters, end quote. On March 25th at 6 a.m., Clint Van Zant took over as negotiation coordinator. The log indicates he reported to SIOC that the negotiators would demand that 10 or 20 people be out by a deadline. If the deadline were, was not met, there would be negative consequences. The Hancock Collection contains a document dated March 27, 1993, entitled Suicide References. The document concluded that Koresh, quote, statistically shows a low suicide rate, more likely to arrange a suicide by cop situation than to commit suicide, end quote. Two persons who were interviewed, quote, felt Passover week and Easter weekend would be significant in a resolution. 
On April 2nd, Schneider told negotiators that the Branch Davidians would come out after the conclusion of Passover. April 5th was the beginning of Passover week. FBI agents were aware of the significance of Passover for the Branch Davidians. The Hancock Collection contains an FBI document entitled Passover Summary dated April 1, 1993, which summarizes the findings of interviews conducted by agents. FBI officials learned that Koresh had often predicted that something would happen to the community during Passover. On April 6, at 3 p.m., SIOC logged a call from the Army at Fort Hood, Texas, concerning the FBI's request for 48 40 millimeter illumination rounds and 36 40 millimeter ferret CS rounds. From April 7th until the end of the siege, HRT operators fired percussion grenades known as flashbangs at Branch Davidians who came out of the building. Frequently, these individuals were in the courtyard where the Branch Davidians were collecting rainwater in containers. On April 9th at 7.03 p.m., Steve Schneider was beckoned outside by one of the tank, tank operators and he was flashbanged. April 9th was Good Friday. At 3.01 p.m., Steve Schneider asked for permission to go outside and light seven canisters of incense, which would emit orange smoke. He wanted to do this between 3 and 4 p.m., the hour that Christ died. Schneider was permitted to do this across the driveway in front of the building. That evening at 6.30 p.m., SIOC logged that an HRT agent in Waco advised an agent in SR, SIOC, quote, that per Jamar and Rogers, there would be no plan to fight a fire should one develop in the Davidian compound, end quote. The law contains no evidence that SIOC officials countermanded the decision. On April 14th, the day after the conclusion of Passover, Koresh and Schneider spoke by telephone with Daguerrean and Zimmerman. The attorneys then advised the FBI agents that Koresh would write his manuscript on the seven seals of the Book of Revelation and then come out. They reported that he anticipated, anticipated spending two days writing the commentary for each seal. At 12.50 p.m., SIOC logged that Byron Sage had reported this development. At 2 p.m. on April 14th, negotiators logged the first discussion with Branch Davidians about word processing supplies. The Branch Davidians requested typewriter ribbon cassettes for their battery-operated word processor. On April 16th, Schneider called a negotiator at 1.15 a.m. to complain that a tank had rammed the building. It hit the front wall while Graham, where Graham Craddock was sleeping in a bunk bed. At 2.35 a.m., Koresh told a negotiator that he had completed composing his commentary on the first seal, and he was working on the second seal. At 3.40 p.m., negotiation coordinator Van Zant gave a report to SIOC on the typewriting equipment the Branch Davidians needed to type Koresh's manuscript. On April 17th at 5 p.m., SIOC logged that Sessions, Clark, and Potts met with Reno on the proposed operational plan. The plan was approved by 7 p.m. It would be implemented on the morning of April 19, 1993. On April 18 at 9 a.m., SIOC logged that Van Zant reported that Schneider had again asked for typewriter ribbon cassettes. Around 7.28 p.m., a Branch Davidian was sent outside to pick up a package containing the typewriter ribbon cassettes and the package also included milk for the children. Two final summaries of FBI interviews are dated April 18, 1993. These documents stress that Koresh was not likely to order a mass suicide, but he had predicted that he and the community would be martyred. Van Zant and psychiatrist Dr. Joseph Krofcheck had produced an analysis in which they described Koresh as, quote, being fully capable of creating circumstances that could take the lives of all his followers and as many of the authorities as possible. 
If FBI officials thought that David Koresh was a crazy cult leader, why did they formulate and carry out an assault that could push him to fulfill his pro prophecies? There is a lot I could say about what the April 19, 1993 log reveals. Here I will zero in on just two entries. Disturbingly, the beginning of the April 19, 1993 log indicates that FBI agents anticipated the possibility of a fire resulting from the tank and CS assault. At 1.25 a.m., Special Agent Robert Zane logged a notation, quote, MD specializing in pediatric burns has called offering assistance, end quote. Zane's log entry states that this physician worked at the Galveston Burn Center. I do not believe that a physician in Galveston, Texas called an FBI agent in Waco, Texas out of the blue. After the building was gassed from 6 a.m. until noon, after the building had suffered a lot of damage from tanks running through it, and after the children and their mothers in the concrete vault at the base of the central tower were gassed at 11.55 a.m., the log records the first sighting of fire at 12.11 p.m. by agents on the ground. Immediately at 12.11, SIOC began inserting comments in the log putting sole responsibility, sole responsibility on the Branch Davidians. Quote, fire start, started at compound appears to have been started by them having torched it, end quote. The logs, memos, and other internal FBI documents in the Lee Hancock collection indicate that FBI decision makers were aware of the Branch Davidians' apocalyptic theology of martyrdom. How far up the chain of command this information was conveyed is unknown. The major event log supports the suspicion of the negotiators expressed by Gary Nessner in his book that the negotiations were being deliberately sabotaged. Deputy Assistant Director Danny Colson, when he was commander of the HRT in 1985, had personally obtained positive results in a siege by keeping a low-key tactical presence and permitting creative negotiation techniques to be implemented. But he was the one who, on March 20, 1993, gave Jabbar the green light to carry out aggressive actions against the Branch Davidians to get, quote, more productive results, end quote. FBI agents have expended much effort in blaming the fire solely on David Koresh and the Branch Davidians. In my view, the responsibility for the fire at Mount Carmel does not rest so much on whether or not some Branch Davidians poured fuel and lit fires, but on the fact that FBI officials knew there was fuel inside the building and that a fire was very likely as indicated by the log entry at 1.25 a.m. on April 19, 1993, about a pediatric burn specialist standing by. FBI agents in Waco and SIOC were aware that Branch Davidians were using kerosene and Coleman lanterns because their electricity had been turned off. FBI agents knew that a large pro propane tank was located behind the central tower close to the kitchen. The FBI's narrative about the fire that has been promoted to the public was constructed before the fire even occurred. The fire that killed 22 children, seven teenagers, and 53 adults was not a surprise to FBI officials logging the entries. Thank you.